The logistic equation with r equals 4 isn't just aperiodic. It also has sensitive dependence on initial conditions, the butterfly effect. In order to illustrate this, I'll need to use a program similar to the one we've already used to plot logistic equation orbits. This program is, there's a link to it down here beneath me, uh, underneath the YouTube, uh, embedded YouTube video on the Complexity Explorer page. As before, if you click on that, a pop-up window, a new window should appear and the program will be in it. I've also made a, a separate page with links to the two programs. It's over here, uh, somewhere in the navigation bar on, on the right. Uh, I think it's section 3.7, it might be 3.8. It's called Logistic Equation Programs. There's only one item in this section and it's a, a text page with links to these two programs. So this way you can find them more easily and you don't have to hunt through the various um, video pages. In any event, I'll use this second program to illustrate the butterfly effect. So here's a program that will let us investigate sensitive dependence on initial conditions. Before I consider the parameter 4, that's the one we're interested in, let's go back and I'll consider the value 2.4. And for this value, I think we've seen before that there's a stable attracting fixed point. So as in the other program, we get to choose the number of iterations to display. I'll choose I don't know, I'll choose 25. And now, rather than one initial condition, we can choose two initial conditions. And it will plot two different time series on the same axis. So let's choose two, uh, sorry, 0 0.2 and 0 0.45. Two different initial conditions. And I click here and make the time series plot. And so, let's see, what I call the second initial condition, that's in green and the first initial condition, that's 0 0.2, that's in purple. And these two initial conditions start kind of far apart, uh, 0.25 apart, but very quickly they both get pulled to the same attracting fixed point. That's what it means to be an attractor. It pulls in nearby orbits. Okay, so there's another plot that this makes, and we can see that if we scroll down to here. And let me see if I can get both of these plots in at the same time. Okay. So the blue curve is the difference between the green and the purple curve. So it tells us how far apart the two orbits are. The two orbits start 0.25 apart, or minus 0.25. I'm going to do, I guess it's set up to do purple minus green, but the sign, if it's positive or negative, doesn't really matter. For what, for what I'm trying to illustrate here. So they start 0.25 apart, and then very quickly, they're just about zero apart because the purple and green orbits or itineraries are right on top of each other. So again, the blue curve is purple minus green. It's the difference between the two, the separation between these two orbits. And because it's attracting, these two orbits get closer together. This blue curve gets closer to zero in absolute value. Lastly, as before, um, this program will also output some numbers. So I call the two time series X and Y. So here's X, 0 0.2, 0 0.34, and so on, and it goes to a, a attracting point at 0.5833. And Y meets a similar fate. It ends up at 0.5833. And this is the difference between these two. It's just X minus Y starts off at minus 0.25. Numbers go positive and negative, but they're getting closer to zero. And by the time we get here, at least within the precision of the computer, the two orbits are exactly the same. So this is just another way of seeing that um, we have an attracting fixed point. It's another way of visualizing what it means to be an attractor. Nearby orbits are pulled closer together, and that's what this blue curve is showing. The blue curve is getting closer and closer to zero. Let's now try the similar experiment, but for an R value of 4.0. Remember, this was the R value that gave aperiodic or non-repeating behavior. So I'll go back to the top. 
I'm going to change this to 4.0. And now I'll make the two initial conditions quite close together, 0.2 and 0.21. So let's make the time series plots and see what happens. There we go. Okay. So we have one initial condition or one itinerary in green and one in purple. So notice that the two itineraries, the two orbits, are pretty close for about four times. They're already pretty far apart here though, at least point one. And then they start to get very different by time step five. And by the time we're at six or seven or eight, they seem completely uncorrelated. They're doing their own thing. And who would have guessed that they started off so close together? We can see a similar thing if I plot the blue curve, that's the difference between the two. Let me shrink things down so they fit on the screen. So the blue curve is the difference between the purple and the green curves. It's how far apart these two trajectories are, these two orbits are, as a function of time. The difference starts off small, initially just 0.01, and it remains small, has a few little bumps, but around 5 the difference spikes up. It's actually greater than 0.25 it looks. And then the difference um, wiggles around. Sometimes it's positive, that means purple is larger than green. Sometimes it's negative, that means green is larger than purple. But the main thing is, is that it starts small and then becomes large, either positive or negative, quite quickly. So to make this example a little bit more concrete, let's go back to thinking about the logistic equation as the model for the population of rabbits on some island. And let's imagine that the true population of rabbits on this island is 0.2. Remember, that just means that it's 20% of the way to the apocalypse um, number, the annihilation number. And let's imagine, moreover, that the only thing that determines the future of the rabbits is the logistic equation. Again, nobody thinks that the logistic equation really controls real rabbit populations, but let's, just as a thought experiment, suppose that was the case. And so then, the first initial condition, I can interpret that as reality, what's actually happening and what will happen. And the second initial condition, I'll think of that as a measured value. So maybe we send some folks to this island and they count all the rabbits, it's not easy to do, um, and they get a value of 0 0.21, expressed as a fraction of the annihilation population. So this rabbit research team has overcounted the rabbits by a little bit. Um, totally understandable, rabbits kind of all look alike, they hop around, they must have counted some of them a couple of, to couple of times, instead of just once. You think, hmm, no big deal. So. Let's see, so now in this scenario, the first initial condition, which is purple, is reality, what actually happens on this island, this very simple island. And the green curve is our prediction. And we've measured pretty well, and we know the rule exactly that determines the rabbit behavior. So the first couple of years, our prediction is pretty good, but then the prediction gets bad here, and even worse, by year five. By year five, we drastically underestimate the number of rabbits. In this context, the blue curve can be thought of as prediction error. It's the difference between the actual behavior of the rabbits and our predicted behavior of the rabbits based on the initial condition that we measured. So at this point we might ask, well this is kind of disappointing, how can we predict the rabbits better? Would like to be able to say with more certainty what they're doing past five or six years or generations or or whatever. And so, since we know the rule that determines them exactly, the thing we need to do in order to do better prediction is to measure the number of rabbits more accurately. So we send the team back and we say, alright, be really, really careful this time. We need as precise a measurement of the rabbits as possible, as close to the true value as possible. And let's say, let's just imagine that they come really, really close. 
So rather than, they don't quite get 0.2 exactly, they get 0.2, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. Let's put one more zero there. So they're within a couple parts in a million. So it's easy to just enter those numbers into the computer, but in reality, doing a measurement that accurate is almost impossible. Certainly, I think for any uh, population, it's impossible to census to one part in a million, probably even for people, but certainly for rabbits. And it's hard to measure things this accurately, even in a physics or chemistry lab. It's possible, but it's not an easy thing. Okay, so our measurement now is about a million times more accurate. So surely we'll have better predictions. Our, the predictions that we'll be able to make with this initial condition in the model will be better. So let's see if that is indeed the case. So I'll click on Make the Time Series Plot. And indeed, the two curves are right on top of each other. The green curve covers up the purple curve for quite some time. We can go maybe all the way out to almost 20, let's say. But by the time we get to 20, the two curves start to become quite, uh, look quite different. So our prediction is great for eight, well, about 20, 18 to 20 generations, but breaks down is wrong after that. And let me plot a few more iterations. I'll go out to 40, see what that looks like. So the prediction is great. The green prediction is right on top of purple reality until about year 20, in which case the two um, curves, prediction and reality, diverge and appear completely unrelated to each other. Let's look at the blue plot for this. So the blue plot is the prediction error. It's the difference between the two curves, the difference between our prediction and the reality. So the difference is very, very small. It's near zero. But uh-oh, around year 16 or 17, it starts to grow just a little bit, and then it explodes year 19, 20, 21, and becomes very large, and we have huge error. So this is a way to visualize the phenomena of uh, sensitive dependence on initial conditions, often abbreviated SDIC. And this is also known as the butterfly effect. The idea is that very small differences in the initial conditions, here about one part or a couple parts in a million, get magnified and then become very large. So the blue curve starts at zero and becomes large, or non-zero, positive or negative. The blue and purple curves start right at each other, and they spread apart. The logistic equation is deterministic. It's just an iterated function, an action repeated again and again and again. So it ought to be completely predictable. And in some sense, it sort of is. However, in order to make accurate predictions, one needs an exceedingly accurate value for the initial condition. So a small error, again, as we've seen, a small error, just a difference, a tiny, tiny difference, becomes very, very large very quickly. So it's not the case that it's unpredictable at all, but because it has this property of sensitive dependence on initial conditions, the starting point matters so much, it's, um, for all in for all practical purposes, impossible to do long-term predictions. Here's another way to perhaps think about this. Let me go back for a moment to this example. So here's 0 0.2 and 0 0.21. And the prediction that we're able to do here is out until, well, the prediction doesn't last very long. <clears throat> Let's be generous and say it lasts for four time steps to the fourth iterate. And after that, the prediction is so bad as to be completely useless. It actually sort of sounds like um, weather forecasts, not coincidentally. In any event, we can predict out um, four time steps, four days, let's say, or four generations. So if we measure more accurately, we should be able to make better predictions. And indeed, that's the case. So I'll go back to this. So now I measured more accurately, and we can go out to, again, just for the sake of argument, let's say we can go to 20. And after 20 time steps, the measurements, uh, the, the prediction becomes essentially worthless. So on the one hand, yes, more accurate measurements do lead to more accurate and longer term predictions. However, in order to improve our prediction time by a factor of only five, 
we had to improve our measurement by a factor of a million. So we have to work a million times as hard to get a result that's only five times better. So yes, it's predictable, but the amount of work we have to do to predict is actually increases exponentially with how long we want to do the prediction for. So this is another way of seeing or thinking about sensitive dependence on initial conditions. I'll do another example, or talk through another scenario, and then I'll define sensitive dependence on initial conditions a bit more carefully.